Okay, so I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar today, School Anxiety and Attendance Challenges, Practical Strategies for High School Professionals. Our presenters today are Dr. Alex DiGiacomo, Dr. Sarah Anderson, and Dr. Rosalind Catchpole. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Horan, and I'm the Program Manager for the BC Children's Kelty Mental Health Resource Center. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I live and work on the beautiful, unceded Coast Salish traditional territory, and I give thanks to Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I also wanted to provide a very brief overview of the Kelty Center. We're a provincial mental health and substance use resource center, and we assess families across the province by helping with understanding and navigating the mental health system, listening and offering peer support, and connecting families to resources and tools. We also provide resources and support to school professionals, such as yourselves, who are supporting youth and their families. Our contact information will be put up at the end of the webinar if you would like to contact us. So just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. As mentioned at the very beginning, everyone is automatically muted and your cameras are turned off so we can't see or hear you. You will have an opportunity to ask questions to the speakers after the presentation. So please submit any questions for the speakers to the Q&A icon you'll see at the bottom of your screen. There has been an option enabled where you can vote for questions that you would also like to see answered, as well as an opt option to submit questions anonymously. Please submit any technical questions or comments, such as if you're having issues with audio, through the chat icon. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the keltymentalhealth.ca website within the next three to four days. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up and we would really appreciate your feedback so we can improve future webinars. The PowerPoint slides will be posted on our website following the webinar, and these will also be sent out to you along with the survey link and an email that you'll receive tomorrow afternoon. We also just wanted to note that the information in this webinar applies to the context in British Columbia. If you're in another jurisdiction, please consult local health and school authorities for further information. So now to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Alex DiGiacomo is a postdoctoral fellow in the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at BC Children's Hospital and the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia, as well as a psychology associate at Cornerstone Child and Family Psychology Clinic. She provides clinical services to children, youth, and families, and conducts research to better understand anxiety disorders. Dr. Alex has a particular interest in supporting skillful and confident parenting and in equipping children to conquer fears and challenges. Dr. Sarah Anderson is a registered psychologist in the Child Psychiatry Unit at BC Children's Hospital, as well as a psychology associate at Cornerstone Child and Family Psychology Clinic. She provides clinical services to children, youth, and families, and has a particular interest in supporting children and youth who experience difficulties attending or staying in school. And Dr. Rosalind Catchpole is a registered psychologist and head of the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at BC Children's Hospital. She is actively involved in treatment, teaching, and research on anxiety disorders, and has a particular interest in parent-led treatment approaches, including those for school refusal. She recently worked with the Canadian Mental Health Association to develop the Competent Parents Thriving Kids Anxiety Program. She has also worked with Anxiety Canada to develop educational materials. She is a clinical instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at UBC and a director of Cornerstone Child and Family Psychology Clinic. So thank you so much, Dr. DiGiacomo, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Catchpole. I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you so much, Michelle, and welcome everyone. We've been really looking forward to this talk today. Dr. DiGiacomo, Dr. Catchpole, and I wanted to start by acknowledging with immense gratitude that we live, work, and play on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. So let's start by giving you an idea of what we'll be covering today. So we're going to jump into the theoretical foundation of school avoidance and relay what we know about it from the literature. Then we'll look at practical strategies for assessment, which will pave the way for concrete steps to coordinating successful school attendance. We also hope that we'll provide you with a solid understanding of how to troubleshoot common traps that come up when doing this work. 
But first, and this is really important to each of us here today, we, we want to say thank you to you, um, all of the school professionals, all of the educators and others who are watching today. Uh, we have nothing but respect and admiration and gratitude for you and your profession, and, and we feel incredibly grateful for how you support um, these youth. Our goal today is really to support you, so please feel free to let us know in the, the Q&A um, or the feedback forms that are sent um, in a follow-up email after this. So what we know about challenges with school non-attendance is they are often rooted in anxiety or mood-based difficulties, and they impact about 2 to 5% of youth. That said, we believe these rates have actually gone up since the beginning of the pandemic because of the unique challenges youth are facing and because difficulty with school attendance is most common during transition periods, like transitioning from virtual schooling to in-person or other normative transition periods, like from elementary school to high school or back to school after summer, winter or, or spring break. Some of you might have students whose challenges in these areas have gotten worse because of the pandemic or who might have never experienced these struggles before and now all of a sudden uh, with COVID they're, they're having a really hard time. Regardless of the reason, we know that the longer a youth is away from school, um, typically the more difficult it is for them to trans transition back, whether that's in person or virtual. To set the foundation for supporting these youth, it's important we talk about what anxiety is and how it works. So anxiety is a normal, necessary, and adaptive human experience that exists on a spectrum. And the function of anxiety adaptively is to keep us safe, like helping us to act quickly and jump out of the way of the path of a speeding car. The experience of anxiety is not harmful to us, but it is uncomfortable and sometimes incredibly so. And it can show up as worry thoughts, the pull to avoid, uncomfortable physical sensations, and distressing emotions. What can unfortunately happen though is that anxiety becomes unhelpful and develops into a false alarm system uh, such that we, we really expect bad things to happen even when often those things do not happen. And what we know is that when that anxiety is interfering with our daily life, uh, support or intervention is needed. Okay, so Dr. Anderson mentioned that anxiety makes us want to avoid the scary thing. The other thing we know about anxiety is that it actually improves by doing the opposite of avoiding. So after repeated successful experiences facing that scary thing, it comes down. So let's take a look at how that actually happens. Okay, so let's say you're teaching a remote class and you have a student who is really nervous about reading out loud and he knows that his turn is coming up. So as he's waiting, his anxiety is climbing and then it peaks, let's say right before he starts reading. So the thing about our bodies is that they can't actually sustain high levels of anxiety for very long. So that anxiety will naturally come down for your student as he stays in that feared situation. However, let's say that as his anxiety is climbing, instead of waiting it out, he types into the chat and says, pass or skip me or something like that. And so he never gets called on. In this scenario, he's going to experience an immediate kind of rush of relief and his anxiety will very quickly decrease. The problem with this is that his memory of anxiety going down is tied to his escape. So now he's gonna associate avoiding the reading with feeling better. So that's why as hard as it is, it's important to not let youth leave at the peak of their anxiety. So the second, third, fourth, fifth time that student who faced their fear of reading out loud is put in that same anxiety provoking situation, their anxiety will be a little bit less than the time before. And similarly, it will go down on its own. So after lots of practices, or you can call them exposures, the anxiety will continue to decrease until it's manageable and may no longer be a concern. 
On the other hand, in the scenario where the student escaped, the next time he's put into a similar position where he's, he needs to read out loud, he's going to experience even more anxiety than the time before. And that makes it even more likely that he'll avoid again. So really what this illustrates is this premise that we're never seeking to fully get rid of anxiety, but rather to cope with it. The thing that we're seeking to get rid of or treat is the avoidance that goes along with the anxiety. Okay, so now that we know how anxiety works, let's talk a little bit about what puts youth more at risk for struggling with school avoidance. We've grouped these characteristics into five areas. So the first is social factors, things like bullying, having more difficulty with social skills, substance abuse, and then educational factors. So learning disorders, developmental delays. If a child had a history of school non-attendance in elementary school, they're more likely to have it again in high school or middle school. Then things like family factors, high stress in the home, conflict, parental separation, and then perhaps not surprisingly, mental health factors, anxiety, depression, trauma. And then of course, there are societal factors that unfortunately put um, youth more at risk, racism, discrimination, economic vulnerability. And so while we want to be really clear that school avoidance is absolutely treatable, it is something that puts youth at risk for detrimental impacts, both in the short term and in the long term. So in the short term, there can be negative impact on academic performance, increased social stress, and greater risk of depressive symptoms. Then in the long term, as youth are heading into early adulthood, they're at risk for premature school dropout, for example, and uh, might find themselves with limited post-secondary opportunities. And then that kind of translates into higher rates of unemployment. We also see this phenomenon called failure to launch, which is kind of a combo of having this underdeveloped skill set compared to other peers, and then also an avoidant coping style. These youth are also at risk for um, high risk for psychiatric disorders. Okay, let's go through a case example. We'll call him Louis. Louis is a compilation of many of the youth um, who we've worked with along the way, and we'll weave him in at various points throughout this talk so that you can see the whole process from start to finish. So Louis is a 15-year-old cisgender male. He's currently in grade 10. This year, he's had multiple kind of week-long periods of non-attendance in person and limited engagement with school. He engages a little bit when school is in person. There's no engagement at all with uh, remote schooling. Louis' family is experiencing pretty high levels of stress these days, financial, marital. And then Louis also has three um, learning disorder diagnoses in math, reading, and writing. He's got a history of social anxiety. More recently, he's been struggling with depression. And then importantly, he loves running. He's on the cross country team and uh, he's a really good runner. Thank you, Dr. Alex. So we wanted to talk in particular about the context of adolescence. So we'll be honest, treating school non-attendance in those older age ranges of middle and high school is often more complicated than it is with younger kids. To put this another way, teenagers can be a little tricky. Um, but we want to really communicate that successful treatment is still very possible and should be expected in the vast majority of cases. And really, I think when we think about the complexities that can come up at this age, they really have a lot to do with the normative developmental context of adolescence. So older kids and teenagers start to develop a whole new set of worries. Um, as peer relationships become more important, both platonically and romantically, we can see more social anxiety crop up about wanting to fit in, a sense of belonging. As adulthood approaches, we can see more concerns about academics or the future. Secondly, we know that in middle school and high school, the demands on youth's organizational skills, time management skills, planning really go up compared to elementary school. And that can be a source of stress for some youth. With some teens in particular, we can sometimes see challenges with engagement and buy-in. So really building that relationship to have them understand that you're a supportive adult that can help is sometimes a bit of a challenge in and of itself. 
And then lastly, particularly when we think about school avoidance, those increased normative increasing independence we see in adolescents, um, particularly in older adolescents, can be a little bit of a challenge where parents might have a bit less influence over things like bedtime or screen time than they do when kids are young. And really the point here we want to make is that coordination, you know, between the school professionals, with the youth, with the family, is really key to successful outcomes. And before we dive into really practical strategies that you can use with your students, we wanted to make the point that just like we want to have compassion for the youth that are struggling with this, we have to have compassion for ourselves as professionals. So we know that it is not easy supporting students with school attendance challenges, especially when those challenges have been going on for a long time. We also know that as school professionals, you have many competing demands and lots and lots of students that you're supporting. And the main message we want to really share is that it's unrealistic to think about supporting youth and families on your own. A team-based approach is really essential in order to avoid burnout or a sense of hopelessness. We wanted to talk a little bit about some common responses that we can have as caring adults when youth are struggling to get to school or to stay in school. And we can think of these a little bit like being on, on a balance or on a teeter-totter, on a scale, where sometimes we can tip towards the side, let's say, of being too soft. And that might relate to a belief that the youth is not able to improve or that the youth is um, really, really struggling. And we might have the, the thoughts like, this is so hard for them, should they even be here? Or I, I don't want to push her. I really want her to trust me. On the flip side, sometimes we can err on the side of being a little bit too tough. And that often comes from a belief that the youth is being manipulative or defiant or, or doing this on purpose. And if we're tilting a bit too much that way, we would often have thoughts like these absences are not acceptable. This is just not OK. They can't be allowed to get away with this. And so what we want instead is a balance between the two. And so on the one hand, we look at the empathy side of things. We know for, for youth in particular, but for all kids, that really knowing that people get that this is hard for them is really important. And we know that that message, that really deep belief that we have in youth, that we know they can do it, is also important. So we think of those as the two E's, the empathy side and the encouragement side. Um, in a way, I was just thinking about this this morning, so we didn't put it in our slides, but in a way, the empathy side probably relates more to accommodations that might be in place to make certain aspects of academics, let's say, easier. Whereas the encouragement side of things would really be that gradual return to school or that stepwise plan to face their fears. And when we're communicating with youth and with parents, we really want to try to reflect both of those sides. So to a teen who's a student in your class, you might say, I know it feels hard being here. And I know you can do it. You can get through this. I'm here for you. Or for caregivers as well, they can struggle with the distress when, they're, when their kids are having trouble. And so we might say, let's say to a middle school parent, I know this feels really stressful and it would be easier to just let him stay home today. And I know he's going to get through this one day at a time. Great work bringing him to school today and following the plan we laid out. Okay, so let's say you have a student, which I'm sure you all do on this webinar, if not many students, who are struggling with school attendance. We wanted to lay out a five-step plan that is really supported by research and helps youth get back to school and have more success. And we're going to go over each of these in detail, but just briefly, these would be first to identify and gather the team, two, to assess the struggle, three, to really set the stage for success in communicating with the youth and the family, then to develop and implement the plan for school return, and lastly, to really keep communicating with the team, the youth, the caregiver, and check in to troubleshoot and to celebrate the successes. 
So let's dive into a little more detail here. Step one is really to identify and gather the team. As we said earlier, this does not typically go well when people are on different pages or don't know what's happening. So as a first step, we want to think about who's on this student's team. Caregivers are really important team members, as is the youth themselves. School professionals. So who's going to be part of the school-based team in this particular case? And thirdly, if there are external mental health professionals involved, they really need to be on the team as well. And if they aren't involved, it may be that a referral is a good idea. And part of the questions you want to ask yourself in this gathering stage is really, who is that point person going to be? Or, or if it's a shared role, that's fine, but who are the point people going to be? Because their job is going to be to lead that assessment of what's been going on and to facilitate the development of the plan. And they're going to be the ones primarily communicating with the youth, the family, the rest of the school-based team, and the external mental health professionals so that there's continuity for that child and everybody knows who, uh, who to communicate with as we work on this plan. Thanks, Dr. Catchpole. Step two involves having that indicated point person or persons conduct a thorough assessment of what's going on for this student and what may be contributing to their challenges with school attendance. So we'll touch on the primary areas of this assessment, including strengths and what's motivating to the youth, understanding what may be maintaining school attendance or school non-attendance and what functions underlie that behavior attending to stressors, and also looking at the severity of the school avoidance. It's also notable that the intervention approach in this talk assumes that the school avoidance is related to an anxiety false alarm. So if school avoidance is instead related to a lack of safety, whether physical or emotional, or threat of violence through racism or bullying or otherwise, um, a more systemic approach is, is really needed to build that foundation first. So the methods by which we would conduct this comprehensive assessment here involve talking with the youth um, and the caregivers. And we recommend using a structured scale. So the school refusal assessment scale revised is a, a free scale that we'll be sending out um, following uh, this talk as well, or you can also Google it and access it online, um, which helps to really flesh out what are those functions that underlie the behavior. And we'll talk more about that. We also want to do a thorough review of school records um, to look at the educational history as well as the school attendance history and to have conversations with relevant school professionals that have been connected with the youth. So in our experience, this really varies. It could be a specific teacher. It could be a school counselor. It could be an EA. Um, it could be a, a teacher from three years ago that they had a particular connection with, just people that might know a little bit more about the youth. And there's also more information about all of this in the accompanying workbook that we're going to be sending out um, through Kelty Mental Health after this talk as well. So we first start with identifying strengths, protective factors, and sources of motivation for the youth. Because finding these sticking points for the youth's buy-in and engagement is so important, and it helps inform the development of a plan, which we'll discuss later. So are there particular classes or school activities that are motivating to the youth? Or are they excited to support a student who's new to the school or maybe help out with younger siblings at home? Um, what areas is a student doing well in, whether this is at school, in the community, uh, or at home? Using the school refusal assessment scale that I mentioned is a great way to better understand what may be keeping challenges with school non-attendance going. So negatively reinforcing functions include those that result in the student escaping bad feelings, such as not having to do a class presentation that they were nervous about or missing a test or missing having to navigate 
social situations, um, as well as positively reinforcing ones, which sometimes are a little bit more subtle, uh, such as having alone time at home during the school day, uh, special attention from a caregiver, um, or access to social media or electronics at home during the school day, for example. Another important area of assessment is accommodation of avoidance. And this can easily occur by the most supportive adults, um, which is when we really allow for that avoidance over and above the supports that the youth may need to function well. For example, we can see this with parents by letting their teens sleep in and maybe miss some school. And we know that while this helps reduce distress and behaviors in the short term, it actually contributes to greater distress and bigger behaviors in the long term. So as Dr. Ketchwell mentioned, adolescence is a period during which there are unique needs and demands. And we've highlighted here some of the primary areas that require further assessment that can contribute to and sometimes exacerbate anxiety. So socially, is, is the youth fitting in and making connections? Are there any conflicts with peers or challenges with social communication? Uh, academically, do they have any learning challenges or individual needs? And how are they supported with those? And how are they coping with those supports? Are they managing their academic workload effectively? Um, organizationally and in regard to executive functioning, how are they planning and organizing themselves in their days? Um, there can be increased demands to these skills as a result of remote schooling. So it's worth looking at whether the youth is remembering their in-person or virtual class schedule um, and whether they're remembering to check due dates and hand in assignments and, and projects remotely. And in regard to family and home life, are there any additional stressors like conflict in the home or an illness in the family that could be contributing to the larger picture as well? So after looking at how much school your student is missing and how long this has been going on for, this will help indicate what level of risk or severity of school non-attendance they can be categorized as roughly. Um, and this is a helpful tool to both help identify those students early, as well as to actually inform the level of intervention and supports that are needed. So some of the, the, the time, youth who have challenges getting to school in middle school and high school may have a history of school avoidance or anxiety at school in the past. And it's really worth noting that early intervention is best. We have the greatest chance to change these youth's trajectories if we intervene when there are first some changes in school attendance or engagement at school. And identifying severity also helps to identify which team members may be needed. So in many cases, youth with more significant or longstanding school non-attendance require additional support, such as external mental health professionals. What we know from working with many teens with school avoidance and their families is that we are least likely to be successful and at the greatest risk of burnout when we work in silos and don't communicate clearly with each other. So many times we have worked with wonderful, dedicated folks like community clinicians or school teams who aren't aware of the other support members on the youth team and as a result are, are not in communication with each other. So each team member, including the caregivers, play a really key role. And when we can support youth in our roles using our unique experiences and expertise, this supports best coordinated care. And each of these support members really have core responsibilities, which we've outlined here and in the accompanying document. When it comes to the youth, though, we just want to make it clear that their role is not to want to go to school or to talk about going to school. It's really just to be courageous and push themselves to get to school following a plan that, that's developed collaboratively. Step three involves setting the stage for success. 
And the first part of this is communicating the results of the assessment with the youth and family, which typically would occur through a meeting with the point person and possibly some other team members if appropriate. So both validating the challenges and stretches and encouraging and communicating confidence that there is hope and that we're here to support the youth attain reasonable goals, both of those things are really key. This meeting is all a, also a really great time to provide some brief psychoeducation uh, to the family about anxiety. So talking a little bit about how it feels distressing and uncomfortable, but it's not harmful and that we can just decrease that distress through the use of a stepwise plan to get things back on track. So this is something that we address in more detail in the accompanying document uh, workbook. So you can refer to that as well. If appropriate, this meeting is also a great time to suggest and support a referral to an external mental health uh, clinician or supports if that's appropriate. Next, in setting the stage for success, we want to identify if there are any challenges in the areas of the three S's. So sleep, sports or physical activity, um, or screen or social media use, and address these areas if there are major barriers in any of them. So we know that these um, having healthy habits in these three core areas really goes a long way towards both reducing anxiety um, in and of itself, as well as increasing the effectiveness of other interventions that we're going to use. Okay, so step four is all about developing and implementing a plan. So this is where we get to put all of that great info, all of those, those insights that we got from the assessment into play. And there are two main components here. The first is developing the fear ladder. Second is planning the actual school reentry. Let's talk about the fear ladder first. Okay, so first of all, what is a fear ladder? So it's a set of increasingly challenging steps towards full school reentry. Now the process of developing a fear ladder should be a collaborative one. So ideally the youth is really involved with this, particularly in identifying rewards for each of the steps that will feel motivating to them. It's important that those are things that they're willing to work for. The other thing about the fear ladder is this is where we take what we learn from the assessment and address the problem areas that came out of that. And so the goal is to repeat each of the steps a few times until anxiety is somewhat lower. It doesn't have to be totally gone. It just needs to be somewhat lower. And just a heads up that in the fear ladder development, there will be anxiety. That's completely normal. And so remember the two E's, the empathize and the encourage. Okay, so it's worth putting a little bit of thought and strategy into preparing the fear ladder before you actually meet um, with the student. So thinking and having at the top of mind everything that you learn from the assessment. So for Louis, what we learned is that his biggest challenge by far was participating in remote schooling with his video on. So he rated that a 10 out of 10 anxiety. The other key thing we learned is he's really motivated to attend cross-country practice. We found out that he likes his social studies teacher, but is afraid of being called on in that class. And we know that for him, math is a big, big struggle. So not only is it hard for him, but he's also really far behind in his work. He's also really worried about being judged by his peers, but when we did the assessment and talked to um, folks who knew more about him, like his social studies teacher, we found out that, oh, there's a peer who sits behind, beside him in social studies who really seems to like him. So that's a good um, piece of information that we got. We also know from Louis that in his 3S assessment, he has a weakness in the area of sleep. Okay, so now it's time to order and, and think strategy with this fear ladder. So this is a pretty obvious one, but because the in-person schooling feels easier for Louis than the remote, that's what we're going to target first. And the added benefit of that is that we'll ensure that he's, his functioning won't get worse because we're keeping up with his routines and his engagement in that. We know that social studies is easier than math, so we're definitely going to target that first before math. And then we're realizing, okay, there's 
three kind of goals here. There's the attendance goal, there's the social goal, and then there's the academic goal. And it's not realistic really to target all of those at once. So Louis, and this is pretty common for youth, he had actually had three separate fear ladders. And the first one was the attendance one. So we just wanted to get him back in class. Now, Louis' love of cross country is gonna be used to, to help motivate him. He was feeling kind of guilty for going to cross country if he wasn't gonna go to, to class. And so part of what we wanted him to know is that that was okay. We talked to his parents about the sleep and his dad committed to helping him work on that. So that was taken care of. And then during the part where we talked to Louis about, okay, what's gonna be motivating for you? He identified video games which is pretty common. So his parents agreed to set aside a budget of $5 a week for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you uh, Louis's first fear ladder. And again, there's two main components to a fear ladder. So there are the rewards that are really important, and then there are the actual steps. So what we agreed on, and this again was driven by Louis for rewards were very small amounts of money, extra screen time, extra privileges, so he, um, found it motivating to get to choose what the family had for dinner, and then getting out of chores. That one works pretty well. Okay, so here are the ser ser series of steps that we went with. And you can tell the first one, go to cross-country practice. We wanted to make sure we're starting with one that we're very confident that he can do. So it might seem small, but it's still a really, really big deal. So he go goes to cross-country practice and gets a small amount of money. And you can see how we structured it with the easier kind of things first. So visit with his social studies teacher for 10 minutes, not even in class, outside of class. And then he was going to social studies but didn't have to participate. Then he's going to social studies and completing just one piece of work. And it was pre-planned what piece of work that would be. And then he's attending for some extra help with math, but not during class time. So here are some, some fear ladder tips. So, and I, we've said this before, but I think it bears repeating. It is totally normal for youth to feel anxious and to protest this. That's okay. So expect some distress and know that it isn't harmful for youth to be facing their, their fears as difficult as it is sometimes to witness. And we talked about this before too, but make sure whatever you do, don't let youth escape right at the peak of that distress. The other thing is, and I kind of touched on this too, but even if you feel like a step seems pretty small, make sure to reward it because these youth, for them, this is a really big deal. And so it's good to kind of acknowledge and reward all of that hard work that they're putting in. And lastly, remember that confidence really does increase with each step. And there's a lot to be said for the momentum that you could build going up this ladder. The other super important thing is, for many youth, it's, it doesn't actually work to create the whole fear ladder ahead of time, and that is okay. You do not need to plan it all out or share it at the very beginning. Sometimes you just do the first step, and then, and then once that is done, you go on to the next one. So you can be creative and flexible with this. Okay, I just wanted to show you an example for remote schooling because uh, like I talked about, we address that after in-person and you can get creative with this too. So for Louie, it was easier to log on to remote schooling, socials for 15 minutes, video off, audio off, he was just logging in. And then step by step, we moved it up to audio on, video on, and he had one pre-planned question that he practiced beforehand that he was gonna answer. Okay, step 4B, planning the school re-entry. The, the most important part of this is to remember that as uncertainty increases, so does anxiety. And the key with this is we're only trying to get the youth back. So for the rest of what's going on, it's important to make the unknowns as known as possible. So that could mean addressing logistical concerns, like where is this youth going to sit? hopefully, you know, far away from any peers that they're having trouble with. Often, um, as, as youth get older, they're nervous about what other people are going to think. So a cover story is often appropriate there. And then the, the expectations need to be very clearly communicated, again, to make as many of the unknowns known. So for Louis, we said, okay, tomorrow you're going to sit in socials, 
You won't have to talk or do any work. Your teacher, all the teacher's going to say, he's just going to say hi. You won't, he won't call on you at all. And then you'll remember from the assessment phase, step 2C was about looking at other areas of stress in the youth's life. And so in this step 4B, when we're playing the reentry, we want to be mindful of decreasing demands in those areas so that the most resource can go to just getting back to school. And so if the, the youth is having academic trouble, like for Louis, he was in math, the, the actual academic expectations were vastly reduced. And so that wasn't something we were going to worry about until later. This is also a good time to make sure you're documenting um, so that everyone on the team, like Dr. Anderson, Dr. Katko said, kind of knows what's going on. Great. And then, so the last step is really to, once you've implemented the, the fear ladder and the re-entry plan and, and things are, are starting to take shape, is really to communicate and check in. So we know that often we have a few false starts or something goes better than we expect. And what we really want to do is, you know, check in with the team, with the youth, with the family to see what's going well and to troubleshoot barriers. So let's say for Louis, the sleep turned out to be much more challenging than we thought. He may need some extra support with that. Or sometimes caregivers are struggling more than we initially anticipated, and we want to make sure that caregivers are supported so that they're able to continue on with the plan. The other reason is we really want to communicate with caregivers as well where they're involved because caregivers can also be quite anxious about uh, these steps. If they're the ones seeing their youth really distressed in the morning or acting out. And so communicating back with those positive messages that, hey, he did great today or she had, you know, she had a good day can be really uh, confidence building for caregivers as well as for your team members. We just wanted to touch briefly on the situation where school-based intervention isn't enough. Some of you are going to be supporting students where things are very complex. Mental health needs are significant. Family functioning is much more poor. Um, and sometimes even with the best school-based plan, it's just not enough without the other two pieces that we know research would say is really important when this is quite severe. And so just briefly to let you know what those look like, um, it's not typically a school-based uh, intervention, although it certainly can be. Um, but we look at, first of all, really providing some caregiver support, particularly around those behavioral strategies. Often what we see with school avoidance is not a sudden picture where the youth and family are doing fine and then they're not going to school all at once. Often it's this insidious trajectory downwards and parents sort of bit by bit can kind of lose their ability to set limits with youth. And so really supporting the caregivers around that we know is really helpful. Lastly, youth, particularly middle school and high school aged youth, really benefit uh, sometimes from individual support for their anxiety or for their mood challenges. And often we're looking at things like cognitive behavioral therapy so that they understand in more detail about anxiety, how it works, how it makes us want to avoid, how we face our fears step by step, and that those two pieces in conjunction with the school consultation and collaboration and plan is often much really needed for, for lasting and significant change when things are more severe. So I want to leave you with a few take home messages and then we'll take your questions. Please submit them in the Q&A if you haven't already. Um, so first of all, understanding the reasons for the school avoidance is really important. Kids who don't attend school are not, not created equal. And so knowing whether there's socially themed worries, academically themed worries, stress at home will really help to inform that intervention. Secondly, we do know that early intervention is associated with better outcomes. So as educators, you're so well placed to, to catch this early in many cases where a student's attendance or even just participation in class seems to be slipping a bit. Thirdly, as, as I just said recently, the intervention intensity really has to match the severity of the avoidance. So if you're all feeling really frustrated, the whole school team is working hard and it doesn't seem like things are moving, it's worth considering whether some caregiver support or individual support might be what's needed. 
The fourth point is really to keep that empathy side or in a way we're thinking about that, so those accommodation sides and the encouragement side or the facing fears side in balance. So certainly accommodations can be really important, sometimes long-term, sometimes short-term, but we wanna balance that with stepwise goals and increasing participation. Uh, fifth is just expect some anxiety. This is hard for youth at first, and so we wanna communicate confidence that we know they can do it. Um, and lastly, it, it does require good coordination, school avoidance and refusal, but it really is treatable. And we've just seen so many youth um, really succeed and, and do much better when, when, uh, when properly supported. So lastly, we'll just share a few resources with you and then we'll take your questions. So as has been said a few times already, Kelty Mental Health, we really do adore working with them, has amazing resources on a lot of topics, uh, including school avoidance. So you'll see webinars for caregivers on school avoidance that can be lovely to share um, if you've got a student who's struggling, um, as well as um, the school refusal assessment scale, uh, which we will send in the follow-up email, but you can also Google just using the, the terms up there. For youth who need external mental health support, the local child and youth mental health team can be a great place to start. And finally, Anxiety Canada is a great website that has a whole bunch of evidence-based information about anxiety disorders of all kinds. So thank you so much for your participation and we really look forward to answering as many questions as we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Catchpole, Dr. Anderson and Dr. DiGiacomo. Uh, just such a wealth of information and just really great examples to go alongside it. So thank you again for that presentation. So I'm seeing some really wonderful questions here in the Q&A. Uh, so I think let's jump right in so we can get to as many as we can. Uh, and again, if you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A icon. If you have more of a comment or a technical question for our team, please submit that in the chat icon. And if there's a question that you already see up there that you would like answered, uh, please uh, just hit the little thumbs up button and it will be uploaded. Okay, so the first question that we have is, um, can you please address how to help those students who do not have parent support? Oh, I can start and then um, others please jump in. So certainly we know this is a lot harder when um, when caregivers are struggling to support or there's a lot of you know chaos or challenges with routines at home. Um, one thing I always really try to remind myself when that's the case is there's often really good reasons why caregivers are struggling. There may be a history of their own trauma or challenges um, with school attendance in their past. And so I always really like to start from a place of assuming that caregivers have really good intent. They may just be struggling with the implementation. So taking the time to build that relationship with the caregiver uh, can sometimes help to set that up uh, in a little bit more of a positive direction. I think the second piece is youth, particularly as they get older, are often able, if we can explain really well why some of these routine things and sleep things really get in the way, and for a youth who's really distressed, they are often motivated to decrease their distress, we can sometimes help them a little bit more individually without as much parent support um, to set some goals of their own, particularly when we connect it to what matters to them, social connection or sports or things like that. The only thing I might add is that this is a situation where um, things are a lot harder. And so I think it's okay to acknowledge that sometimes things move a little bit slower in the whole process of things. And sometimes just taking that pressure off can be helpful because it's truly a really tough situation when there isn't any or as much support at home. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so moving on to the next question, um, can you please address the COVID concern and anxiety? We have students not even leaving their home because of their fear of COVID. So I can start and, and feel free to jump in. Um, so we're certainly in a very unique circumstance right now in that um, 
there are different kinds of, of stressors and concerns and fears than there may typically be in a school year. And, and uh, speaking to COVID in particular, um, we certainly are seeing lots of youth and families who um, are fearful about uh, school attendance for this reason. Um, so I think we, we always have to default to sort of the family's decision and, and choice around what's going to work best for them and what their personal decision is about their child's, their youth school attendance in a particular year. Um, that said, oftentimes there are discrepancies between what caregivers and youth um, think is appropriate. And so we really try to go back to A, what kind of information is being communicated to the youth. So if there's a lot of um, access to information or conversations at home that are happening around, you know, fear of COVID or increased numbers, um, and then, okay, you know, off to school tomorrow and, you know, you don't have to wear um, a mask if you don't want to. There can be clearly a lot of anxiety there, understandably so. So we want to really address kind of that messaging that's being communicated to the youth um, before anything else. Um, I would say, though, really that the plan that we would follow wouldn't look significantly different, um, regardless of whether it was a social fear or whether it was a fear of, of COVID necessarily. So we really first want to identify what are kind of feasible, reasonable goals for the youth, um, kind of meeting them where they're at. If they're, if they're not even leaving their house um, because they're so fearful um, of, of catching COVID, then we might even completely back up and start there. Okay, can they even start by, you know, walking out the front door uh, for the first day? And that's the first step on their fear ladder. And getting to school might be a little bit farther along from for them if there is a lot of anxiety and avoidance of kind of being in the outside world. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Anderson. Uh, the next question is about how to make the home boring. So Wi-Fi and devices can't be blocked when others are using Wi-Fi. And for youth, taking away devices seems to be a disruption of teens' basic rights these days. So can you explain a little bit more about how to make the home environment boring? So I can start and then others can jump in. Um, so look, this is tricky. And I think the older the youth gets, the trickier it gets. That being said, the reason we put this in this talk is because I think sometimes I can feel this way too. We can sort of feel a bit like it's hopeless. There isn't really anything we can do to address this like 12 hours of screen time that this youth is having. And I, I don't think that that's true. And so certainly, you know, if parents are buying the phone and paying for the phone plan, I think it's reasonable to say, the step on your ladder today is to go to school for 30 minutes and we're happy to give your give you your phone back after you've done that um, so helping parents to set some reasonable limits i think is often an appropriate part of of this plan um, and i think the other piece is we can actually believe it or not sometimes get buy-in from teens to do this because they really are aware that it's hard I mean, teenagers don't like being stuck at home and feeling terrified to come into the school building. And so sometimes the way I explain this is just, look, it's really hard to fight anxiety all by yourself. And so we know that if your mom and dad remind you to, you know, to get to bed by midnight or, you know, they, they, you, you get that phone time, you know, as a celebration when you get home from the, the school from the step on your ladder, it actually does help it go more smoothly. And it, and we sometimes can get buy-in. If, you know, if you have an 18 year old whose parents have struggled to set limits for the last 16 years, um, that, that's a different conversation. And it may be that that's just not an area that is modifiable, at least within the resourcing that you have available um, as a school professional. And I would say then that's where it's really important probably to have some caregiver support to look at what is reasonable and realistic um, in, in that situation. Great. So the next question is, can you provide suggestions for how to stop the youth from escaping as their anxiety is peaking? That's a good question. And I wonder if the person asking is asking because they've had experience with youth trying to escape or whether they're just um, curious. What the first thing that comes to mind for me is that when you're developing the fear ladder, 
If care is taken to make the steps appropriately difficult, typically youth won't try to escape. So if, if you're in a situation where there are repeated attempts to escape, it could be that the step is too hard. It could be that the reward isn't motivating enough. The other thing I, I'm thinking about is don't underestimate the power of just some encouraging words in the moment, you know, because don't forget the youth, they're experiencing a lot of distress. So just saying, remember, um, you're, being, you're being brave, you'll get through this, you're almost done. That can go a long way too. Also some scaffolding. So if you're finding that, you know, like right before whatever the brave step is, there's a lot of jitters, um, you could do some pre-planning. Like you could say, okay, remember, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. That tends to calm, um, calm youth down as well. And if you, but the other part of me is wondering, like, maybe you were in a situation where you thought the youth was going to escape. And so you got a little nervous and then kind of felt like, oh, no, maybe this is too much. So the other thing I want to say is right before the, the step, it's typical for them to look really anxious, but don't underestimate what they can actually do. Like oftentimes kids look really, really, really anxious and you're like, oh, oh I don't know how this is going to go. And then they pull through and they're just fine. And Dr. Alex mentioned this as well, but I just want to clarify that, you know, if, if you do have a youth that, for example, you know, you've decided on a step collaboratively, that's what you're going to go for, and you've tried it a couple of times and it's just not successful, then that really is an indication that, okay, we need to pull back. This isn't a failure on their part or your part. Um, this is an indication that that's actually too difficult of a step. And okay, you know, maybe we have a couple steps on the ladder. Are there a few kind of mini steps that we can add in between that and try some of those and then kind of build on that momentum? Because this work is all about having successes, small successes, and building on the momentum of the successes so that a goal that seems completely unreasonable at the beginning is something that we can slowly work up to. Um, and for some youth, they may need to stay on the same step on the ladder for, you know, a week at a time, or it really depends. Um, whereas other youth might be okay to, okay, I've done this step, I'm ready to go to the next one. So it, it kind of depends on how long standing the challenges are, what the specific focus of that ladder is, and, and also what the specific step is. And I think looking at the time, we have time for two more questions, let's say, um, and then we'll just do our final slide. So how would you influence the three S's if they are struggling in all three and have limited parent or guardian monitoring throughout non-school hours? So I think this, in a way, we've answered this, I think, it, as part of some of the other questions. But I, I, just to add a few things to it, I guess I would say that's where it's really, really critical to look at what is motivating to the youth, what matters to them. If they don't have a lot of outside monitoring or structure, then, I mean, not that this ever works with teens, but we're really not going to have any luck just saying, hey, get to math class. You know, I don't care that you find it really hard and boring. Go taking that time to find out, you know, they love their cross country team, or they have a good connection with a teacher, and maybe they wouldn't mind actually helping, I don't know, you know, get some papers ready or things like that. Um, or or they, they have a particular extracurricular interest, I think is really key. Because I mean, just so many times, I've seen teens who are, you know, really unwilling to go to bed earlier to get to math class, but might actually be willing to go to bed, to bed earlier to get to a club that they care about or to meet a peer um, that they enjoy spending time with. So I think kind of going back to that and then again, linking for that youth what their goals are and then how their habits are helping or not helping the situation. Um, and again, I would reiterate that caregiver support in these situations can be really important, particularly for younger teens. Like if you know, I've worked with middle school, young high school aged kids where they're, they're developmentally way too young to have complete independence. And so if parents are really struggling to that extent, probably the best thing that you can do for that youth is to try to get their parents some support so that that, that pathway just doesn't, doesn't get worse and worse as they get older. 
Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, there's so many other great questions here that we're unfortunately not going to have time to answer. If we haven't gotten to your question, please don't hesitate to email us or call us at the Kelty Center and we'll be able to support you in answering your question. We'll put our contact information up on the last slide. Uh, so um, the very last question is knowing each case is individual, what are some general timelines that you see for returning to school one month, three months longer? Yeah, this is a good question, and everyone wants to know the answer to it, really. And um, this is probably not a satisfactory answer, but it really depends on the severity. So if there's a, a youth who, let's say they've missed, like, a few days here and there, really, they should be getting back pretty much right away. If you've got a youth who's been out for several months, it's probably going to take a while. And sometimes um, school professionals and parents can feel pressure to do that really, really quickly, and that's not necessarily helpful. So if, if you have a youth who's been out for a long time, like months, um, of course the goal is still to keep improving and keep inching your way back to a full return, but it's likely not going to happen until some of the more foundational things are addressed, and that can take, you know, a few months as well. I would just add one last thing, which is it's probably more important to be looking at are things moving up the ladder rather than how quickly we get to an end goal. If it's getting really stuck and we're not making progress, that's more of a challenge. Um, and I would just add lastly that it, sometimes it's a little bit of a sort of iterative process in some ways because you don't really know until you start doing it. Um, so you may kind of have a timeline in your mind based on the severity, based on that history, but it's not until you start doing it that you, you see sort of how quickly they're able to move up the ladder or ladders um, that they might have. Um, and then at that point, you might have a better sense of, okay, what, what's our, our reasonable timeline for full school return or whatever your eventual goal is. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Catchpole, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. DiGiacomo. Um, such helpful information here today. Uh, thank you also to everyone who attended today. We hope that you found this webinar helpful. And please just remember to uh, fill out our survey that will pop up after the webinar closes. Uh, our contact, contact information is up on the slide here if you would like to contact us. And um, wishing you all a good evening. <laughs>